Hello and welcome back to another episode of what it's like to winter in Antarctica at Rothera Research Station. These interviews are conducted live from Antarctica. I'm your host, Nadia. Today we will hear from Alice Clement, otherwise referred to as Liss. This episode ties in really nicely with the preceding episode of Louis Day because Liss was also part of the Marine team and due to an unfortunate circumstance of events, Liss had to step up and take on certain responsibilities that the Marine assistant would normally do. We'll hear more about a detailed description from Ryan Matthews, who was the Marine assistant the year before. But for now, this episode focuses a lot on Liss's background and how they transitioned into working with the British Antarctic Survey. Alice Clement, thank you very much for joining me on this episode of the Ice World podcast. Can you introduce yourself, please? Hello, my name is Alice Clement, but people here call me Liz, and I'm here working as the dive officer, and over winter I've been working as the marine assistant as well. Yes, so here at Rotherup you are part of the marine team and you've taken on a lot of different roles, which is super cool. Going back to the beginning, how did you first get into Antarctic science? So I studied marine biology at university and one of my modules there was polar biology and the professor who taught it had come and worked for British Antarctic Survey and they did quite a lot of emphasis on working for bass and what they did there. They came down here to study the plankton down here and diatoms. Emily Roberts, I think they came down here quite a few years ago, but um, yeah, she did her... She focused mainly on diatoms, but she did a big module on polar ecology and I was just super interested by it and got really interested into it. I then finished marine biology at uni and went travelling, but always really fancied coming back to work in Antarctica. So I was living and working in New Zealand at the time when I saw an advert for the krill fishing vessels to work as a scientific observer on there. So I thought I'd apply for it, thinking I would never get it and ended up working a couple of months later on a krill fishing vessel in South Orkney Isles, working as a scientific observer there. What do you do as a scientific observer? What's your role? So you're working with the fishing vessels as a separate organisation to try and monitor what they're catching and checking what their bycatch is, what they're catching that they shouldn't be catching. And if it becomes too great or there's too many of certain organisms that they are catching, then it needs to be reported back. You're also checking things like bird strikes and whale interactions. So essentially you're just on there to make sure that the fishing is still as environmentally friendly and within catch quotas as possible. And that is a legal requirement for these mm-hmm. vessels, that they have to have somebody like you. Are you a single person? You're, yeah. There's only one observer on yeah. each vessel. Yeah. So quite a lonely job. Yeah, so the observers, they work for the entity called CAMLA. So that stands for the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. And they are essentially the sea version of the Antarctic Treaty and the Madrid Protocol. So they are there to ensure that the marine life around Antarctica is monitored because the Antarctic Treaty only covers land. So if everyone was just allowed to do whatever they wanted in Antarctica, then you could obviously really overexploit the resources. As historically, yeah. we have done. OK, so you were working in the South Orkney Islands. So that's Signy one of the British Antarctic bases at mm-hmm. 60 degrees of latitude. Mm-hmm. Did you get to go and visit that base at all? No, we didn't go on land near there. And it was the time of year I was there, the the base wasn't open, there was no one there. Oh, it's summer only. Um, yeah. So we occasionally would shelter, if it was really stormy, we'd shelter in harbours, and occasionally one of the harbours we sheltered near, you could see the base, but okay. you could never go on land for it. I think you needed permission from Bass to go on there. Yeah, so we didn't go on land there, but I could see it. And I thought, that looks like a really cool place. I wonder how you get to work there. And then the same vessel I was on, you fish in South Orkney Isles because it's looking for krill. And South Orkney Isles has a bigger catch quota and a better likelihood of catching krill than South Georgia. However, South Orkney Isles, ice is over first in the Antarctic. And because of the Weddell Sea, the South Orkney Isles ice over first. So once that ice is over, fishing vessels move up to South Georgia. So that's when I then went to South Georgia and worked on a fishing vessel there. And because South Georgia government, they put an extra layer of restrictions on krill fishing vessels, on fishing vessels in the area, because it's a government-owned area, South Georgia. So you have to be a South Georgia government observer as well as a Kamala observer so that's why I was there. Do you and have to retrain to become no, a South Georgia it's, it's observer the same. or it's just your title changes? It's essentially the same you just do a few more 
observations and the report also goes to the South Georgia government as well as Kamala. I think one of the requirements is you have to have a British passport to be heir. But one of the things that happens there is the fisheries biologist from KEP, King Edward Point, comes on board and checks you're okay, checks your living quarters are good, checks that you are being treated well, checks you have all the materials you need for sampling, etc, etc. Yeah, the fisheries person came on board and I met them and I said, what do you do? She, it was Vicky Foster. So she said, oh, I'm a fisheries scientist at KEP. I do this, this and this. So that sounds really cool. So then I applied for that job and then got into bass that way. Incredible. Where did you first set foot on Antarctica? When you were on those vessels, did you get to go onto land at all? So occasionally you would go on little boat trips that you would come off. So I would say probably South Orkney Isles. I never set foot on actual Antarctica until I came here to do this job. So actually outside of the Antarctic Circle... Yeah. The first time was yeah. when you came to Rothera. Yeah, because okay. I've been on fishing vessels down here and around the Bransfield Strait, but yeah. I never got on land. So I could see it. I remember looking out and seeing land and be like, oh, I can see it. mainland Antarctica. Being inspired from working on the fisheries vessels, was it a job that you would like to have continued? Or was it quite difficult to see something that you're trying to conserve? Of course, you're working towards the mm. conservation of it, but then that's also a destructive way of yeah. eating protein. It is, but the world needs protein. Yes. And krill have such a high biomass that the total allowable catch of krill is so much higher than the current catch rate because the mm-hmm. biomass is so large. The fisheries models predict that you can take a massive amount of krill out of the population and they still are stable. That's, That's just surplus. using models, so, so it's a very tricky one to predict. Also, krill tend to swarm in certain areas, so mm. it's really hard to predict population sizes of krill. You get quite biased estimates, but, and you need representative sampling across the whole of yeah, and you just their distribution, which is extremely it's challenging, huge. especially in sub-Antarctic yeah. and Antarctic waters. So it's difficult to tell, but the world needs protein, and krill is definitely one of the more sustainable proteins you can get. Who eats krill? It's uh, used a lot in fish meal. Uh, some Asian markets eat it directly. It's actually really tasty. It tastes a little bit like tiny lobster or kind of crayfish type taste. It's not very prawny. I think it's just marketing is the reason why people don't eat krill. Different vessels have different abilities in the factory to do different things. So the vessels that I used to work on, usually they would grind up the krill, bake it at a super high temperature, grind it up and it would be into powdered meal. So then it would go down into pellets for aquaculture. But other vessels would freeze it whole and that would be eaten by humans. Some vessels extract the oil from it. So at certain times of year, depending on what the krill has been eating and how healthy krill is, you can get really good omega-3 from the krill and that can be used for human omega-3 supplements, mm, supplements yeah. which are actually meant to be a lot better for you than cod liver oil omega-3 just because the human body can process it in a different way. They also don't taste or smell like fish, which cod liver oil does. So it's seen as a higher end omega-3 acid than cod liver oil. So it's actually really profitable if you can do that. But you have to have quite a developed factory to be able to extract that out. That's insane that they can then Mm. process it on board and make Mm. it into meal and bake it. And technology is just so sophisticated. Observing that and working on that vessel, did you see your future within in those vessels? No. I really enjoy working as an observer and I find working with crew usually is really actually quite a nice thing to do. However, you are separate from the crew and you are on your own on the vessels and a lot of the crew are very friendly but it's quite a hard life and you're working in some of the roughest seas in the world as well so almost every day you know you're being thrown around and it's quite grim it's quite long hours you're doing your hours in time with the fishing vessels fishing vessels continue through the night it also has got a lot of perks because you wake up and you just stick your head out the window and there's whales everywhere and you get to see albatross every day working with krill I find very interesting once you've done observing for a few times you've done observing yeah there's not a lot of progression with that so I would absolutely go back to it if I had a few months spare and wanted to have a quick job but I wouldn't do it for life so then the fisheries biologist at King Edward Point that's more of a research role with Mm -hmm. progression in it so you applied Mm -hmm. and you got it 
Yeah. And you went to King Edward Point for a winter. Tell me about it. It was amazing. King Edward Point is very different to Rothera. There's eight of you that overwinter and only Tiny. two biologists. Now it's slightly changed in its structure, but back then there was a fisheries biologist and there was a zoologist. And the zoologist would focus mainly on the birds, penguins, giant petrels, penguins, and the seals, mm. looking at the health of those populations to see what the fisheries are doing to those populations there. And then the fisheries biologist would focus, obviously, on the fisheries. So once a month, I go out and do plankton trawling to look at mainly larval fish to see what larval fish were in the water column. I also did a ground fish survey. So you go out on a trawling vessel and you do 70 random trawls around South Georgia and they're all in different depths in different places and it's meant to be a random sampling of South Georgian waters. And then with that, you take the fish and you're looking at their diet. So you're looking at stomach contents, size, weight. You're taking the otoliths out to look at their age for certain fish and just general numbers to see what the health of the population is. Does anyone else help you process that? Because that is an enormous undertaking, mm. collecting 70 samples. A yeah. diverse community. Are you expected to process all of that? So on the vessel, there's a team of us. So some scientists come down from Bass Cambridge and some scientists from South Georgia government come and they come and help you. So there's meant to be five of us, but I think there ended up being four of us on the time I did it. They help. There was a fisheries person from CFAS as well. So on the vessel, everyone's there and you go in and the trawl comes in and everyone's in the factory and you pick a fish, you pick a species and you normally pair off and someone's just got a board with a length and a weight thing and you just read it out fish after fish, process the whole catch and then fish that you are interested in. For instance, we were looking at mackerel ice fish because that is one of the fisheries there in South Georgia and we were looking at Nodothinia drossii, marble drop cod because they are a recovering fish stock from a previous exploited fisheries. So those ones we would take out the otoliths and the stomachs and then the same with toothfish because toothfish, Patagonian toothfish and Antarctic toothfish but around there it was more Patagonian toothfish. They were looking for the fisheries there as well. Patagonian toothfish are huge, Mm -hmm. right? Like a couple of metres long? The ones that are a couple of metres are rare. Biggest one I think I've seen recorded was 2 metres 16 long, huge. But that's just what I've seen. That The head of that is in the freezer at King Edward Point and the head is absolutely huge. It's so heavy, it's ridiculous. Insane. The average ones that we were pulling up would be about a metre long. They're still big and they're chunky fish, so they're quite hard to handle and they come up alive, so yeah, you've got to kind of wrestle them. And all this catch that you're processing, does it get processed and then put back? We tried to process some and put it back, but then you've got restrictions with discards. You can't throw back really anything that's dead because you don't want to attract seabirds. I think we were under a different permit because we were doing a scientific survey. But we would try and get rid of everything that we could back to the sea. Certain things we kept. So obviously if you're taking the stomachs out, they're dead. But the macrolized fish are really good eating. And the vessel itself that we were on was a macrolized fishing vessel that we hired, chartered, sorry, for the survey. So they had crew on it that would help process it. The toothfish, you wouldn't get many. So the ones you got, you tended to keep. And we took some back to King Edward Point for eating. The vessel would sometimes eat it. You do get discards and you do get waste. And inevitably, you're bringing fish up from the bottom. So some Their of them swim have... swim bladder yeah, is rupturing. Some of them have injuries. Pressure. But generally, some you could send back. Are you amazed at the diversity? Because I remember also doing some work experience on some scientific trawls in Plymouth Sound. And the first catch, there is just so much life in a single trawl. Some trawls, we would have really just one type of fish, though. Some of the scientists that came and helped us, they helped the same survey every year. So they would come back and do it. And one of them was just so good. They'd look at any fish and straight away be able to identify it. The They'd look into the catch and be like, oh, there's going to be lots of rossi eye this catch. You'd be like, How do you know? It's just the beauty of being a specialist. Some trawls would come up and it would be just one type of fish and obviously a few others. And then some would come up and it would be lots of different ones. And what kind of contents were you finding within the stomachs? What kind of prey? We would tend to take the stomachs and then we'd take them back to King Edward Point and then that's what I would then do. Over the winter, I then processed the stomachs. So I had a couple of hundred macrolized fish stomachs and rossi eye stomachs to look into. Generally, that's what we're doing it for is the macrolized fish, they will always try and favour krill because it's nutritious. That's what essentially we're taking the stomachs out for to see if there's lots of krill in their stomachs. It means there's lots of krill in the environment because they can find it and eat it. What they were actually, most of them were eating was the misto. So it's a type of pelagic amphipod that has a very similar need to krill but that will come in to certain areas when krill is not as abundant. The year that I did it there was a lot of the misto in the stomachs as well. There was still krill in them but it's very telling and actually the year I did the trawl survey the macrolized fish numbers were very very small to the point that they didn't open the fisheries the next year. Is that as a result of the data that's been supplied from those surveys? 
does that contribute towards then regulating if yeah. the fisheries were yeah. open or not? Yeah. So that's absolutely. having such a tangible impact. It's a very direct impact. But it's also useful because the, the fishing vessel itself was a macrolized fish fishing mm. vessel. And they said at the end of the survey, they were like, we're not sure there's much point in us fishing <laughs> that as a target species because we just had hardly seen any. It wasn't the high catches that you were hoping for. Yeah, it would mainly be krill and the misto, and then the rossii, they eat a lot of mycids, and they also are scavengers, so you would occasionally get a random fish in the stomach. So you could sometimes pick otoliths out of stomachs to tell what fish has been eaten. You can identify species by the otolith, which is the ear bone that sits inside mm-hmm. an ear. How do you differentiate between species? What are the defining features of the otolith? So an otolith will grow quicker when a fish is eating more. So in the summer, the otolith grows more, so it's exactly the same concept as tree rings. So that's how you can age it. The the actual shape of the otolith is different shape. depending on the fish. If you look at the ID books, then most ID books here will have the fish and then next to it will be a picture of the otolith. So quite often I was dissecting stomachs and you'd get something with a backbone, so you'd know it's a fish, assume it was a fish, but then you'd just be looking in regurgitated stomach stuff for an otolith. And then from that you can find out what fish it is. And you can get them really specifically as well, especially ice fish, they have pretty obvious shapes of their otoliths. And did you do anything else as part of that job? So processing stomach contents and then doing the field work on mm-hmm. the vessels. Was there any other elements to the fisheries biologist job? There's processing the otoliths themselves. So you have to set the otoliths in resin and then cut them extremely fine. So you can shine a light through one side and look at them under a microscope to count the rings. So aging yeah. them. Um, I didn't actually age them because the government tries to use the same person year on year to age them. It can be a little bit down to interpretation, some things if they're a ring or not a ring. There's that. There's also helping out the zoologist. So I would go and do giant petrol surveys and seal surveys and Gen 2 surveys as well, where you're measuring the health of the population by looking at how many young they have, how many eggs they're having, success rate of eggs, and then you would catch the fledglings of the, the giant petrels or the baby seals and you'd weigh them to see if they were strong enough. How would you summarise overall your experience at King Edward Point? Would you like to go back and do a similar yeah. job or I'd do the same job? I'd love to go back. I'd happily go back and do the same job because I think it takes a long time to get your eye in with a lot of the identification. Absolutely. Especially with the planks and trawls and things like this. And it takes quite a long time to get used to the way of life there. That was my first bass job. So you spend a lot of the time kind of learning how to just do day-to-day tasks and be in a subantarctic environment. You were there for... It was, I think, 14 months. 14 months. So what made you want to come to Rothera? Rothera was always my main aim it just felt like the most antarctic station where you can still do marine biology so when i was at king edward point i found it so interesting and i actually ended up really enjoying it in its own thing but i really took it as a stepping stone to get into bass so then i thought i just have to go to rothera the main focus on marine science down here is a lot more than king edward point because you only have two scientists there whereas here over the summer you've got visiting scientists and then the other thing was obviously you've got scuba diving down here so before i was working on the fishing vessels i was working in the scuba industry it's something that i've always done and loved So you have been working as the dive officer and as the marine assistant. So that's taken like a different aspect to moving away from larval ecology and fish, Mm -hmm. but to now water sampling. How have you found that experience of a different skill set? Awesome. I've loved it. I was apprehensive in taking it initially because it's a lot more oceanography and water sampling than I'm used to but I find it really interesting even just from doing it over the winter you can see the difference in the water chemistry and the life in the water and every time you do water sampling you get different results depending on the time of year and the light in the area so yeah I've loved it I found it really interesting so that's you going out on the boat and then dropping a CTD and collecting water samples with a Niskin bottle you also got another side project similar to something that you were doing in KEP with larval fish? Yeah, plankton trawling. So because obviously we're not diving over winter, I had a bit of extra time. So I thought, why not use it to do some more plankton trawling? This is a different setup to King Edward Point ones because we've got a smaller boat and because it's a different ecology down here. So we did vertical trawls instead. KP, sorry, you were doing horizontal trawls. Yeah. You were aiming to set the depth at about 30 metres and the trawl was in twilight to try and get... all oh, the diurnal migration. Yeah, and it was along the same transit once a month. Okay, there's two different points, one oh. in the north of the island and one in the south of the island. So here we are, again, looking for plankton. It's actually completely different here 
to King Edward Point because the plankton that we're getting is a lot smaller. The smallest things you'd get at King Edward Point were things like copia pods, so they'd be a couple of millimetres long, and that would be really the smallest things you're finding. Those are generally the biggest things you're finding in this drawer here. So it's really using a lot of microscope work and fine mesh filters to try and find absolute tiny larval stages of a lot of benthic organisms. And what kind of larval stages have you found from your tools so far? At the moment, the most things we've got are copia pods, but then we've also got a lot of amphipods and a lot of nematean larval stages of them, which don't look even slightly like the, the adult, adult form. Stage That's the amazing thing about phytoplankton. Yeah. They just, they just look like a smushed up ball and some annelids. So everything that eventually ends up on the sea floor in its planktonic stage at the moment, diving in the summer when we were diving and you see all the adult forms. And then now I'm doing plankton trawling in the winter and I'm finding all the tiny larval forms of those things. It's really nice to see. And now we're moving towards the summer. So you did a survey in the winter and now you've done one in that spring period. And you found, although it's you obviously need a lot more samples to conclusively say there's mm. a difference, but you have found a lot more diversity and yeah. abundance yeah. in this transition in towards spring, which makes sense because a lot of invertebrates time the release of their offspring when there's mm. available food that comes with more light and our daylight is increasing. So that's a really cool trend. It'll be interesting to see what you find in the next one as we're approaching summer. You can also marry it up with the water sampling data and have a look mm-hmm. at productivity in the water column. What are your future plans? I'd love to come back and do a winter in a scientific role. To be able to do the winter as marine assistant or part of marine assistant has been incredible and I would love to be able to do that for a whole year th- and see it through. I absolutely want to stay with bass. I think working and living in Antarctica is such an amazing opportunity that it's a, such an incredible job that you can't really get elsewhere. I'd love to come back. We'll see. Thanks so much for talking to me, Liz. You're very welcome. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Ice World podcast. This episode was totally packed with scientific information. I would also like to apologise for getting so excited and interrupting. I only really realised that when editing it. It's a subject that is really close to my heart in terms of marine biology, so we definitely have a lot of points in common. It was quite a technical discussion and many words were mentioned that if you don't necessarily work in the field of marine biology, you might not know what they are. So just to clarify, benthic organisms are anything that lives on the seafloor. Liz talked about amphipods and mycids. These are a grouping of animals that fall within crustaceans, similar to copepods as well. Copepods are part of the zooplankton and are predatory and can eat other members of the phytoplankton. Liz talked about nematean and worms and, and polychaetes. These are another grouping of marine worms. Really interesting about the Patagonian toothfish and how enormous fish can inhabit South Georgian waters. I also read that they can weigh up to 100 kilograms, which is impressive. I'd also like to explain that a scientific trawl is used to collect information about the environment. It's essentially a net in the case of a plankton trawl that is towed behind a boat with a filter at the end and samples the water column over a specific depth or in the case of Liss at Rothera, a vertical profile of the water column. So Liss was taking samples from three different depths within the water column. Scientific tools can also consist of a net with weights that is towed on the sea floor, and this collects all the ground fish that Liss was talking about during that survey. So everything benthic that lives on the sea floor is sampled in those more heavy duty trawls. This is something that Liss conducted at South Georgia, and they talked about working with people from CFAS. CFAS stands for the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science, and it is a department of the UK government working towards protection, conservation and monitoring of our oceans. If you're joining us for the first time, we use the acronym BAS a lot, which stands for the British Antarctic Survey. I'm really excited to say that Alice Clement is going back to Rothera for another winter season of 18 months as Rothera's marine assistant overwintering once again. Liz is currently in the Falkland Islands waiting for the Sir David Attenborough to take them to Rothera Research Station. A final note of this podcast is you'll notice that I refer to Liz as they in accordance with the they them pronouns. Thank you very much for tuning in to this episode of the Ice World podcast. See you next time.